to the Top Order podcast. It is World Cup wrap-up time. It's like a holiday. It's just about to end for the Top Order podcast, boys. We've got a couple of days left, um, but we are going to be on the Sun Loungers for a little while longer. Today, we're going to talk about match 44, England versus Pakistan, and the 45th, uh, sorry, 43rd match of the tournament as well, um, which saw Bangladesh play Australia. All coming up on the Top Order podcast. Stay tuned. So, boys, we had a couple of games um, last night. I think we're gonna we're gonna cover them the wrong way around, aren't we? I think from uh, running notes, we'll talk a little bit of England, Pakistan, and then we'll uh, move over to our Australian uh, correspondent focusing on Townsville um, over in uh, <laughs> over in Fongaparoa, and um, to give us a little bit of a rundown of Australia versus Bangladesh. I'm going to start with Stu. So. Um, I've been in New Zealand 12 years now, and I don't think I've ever seen a Kiwi um, rooting for England at any stage. <laughs> um, but I think Stu can talk us through why that was the case um, last night and why he was also very keen to watch um, watch a coin go up in the air and land <laughs> as well. Stu, over to you, mate. Oh, Binksy, look, millions of, pe- millions of people all around New Zealand tuned in at 9pm last night uh, here in here in uh, in Aotearoa to uh, to watch that coin flip, uh, Joss Butler. We can just talk through it. It was a, gr- a wonderful moment. Joss Butler fires the coin up in the air. It's spinning round. Barbara Azam calls heads. It drops to the ground. Javagil Srinath walks over, takes a look, tails. Joss Butler has a big grin on his face. Barbara Azam's ha- face just just crumbles into little pieces. And, uh, and Joss Butler says, we'll have a bat, thanks. And all of New Zealand just starts cheering. Uh, look, I, I, uh, I, I had a big shout. I had a big shout from upstairs as well as my wife was trying to put our children to bed. She said, look, Ch- Stuart, people are trying to sleep here. <laughs> but basically, for anyone who doesn't know, as soon as Pakistan were, well, as soon as England batted first, New Zealand was essentially into the semifinals, I think, uh, Although there was some misleading information, or I don't know, I'm kind of confused now about the run rates, but people were saying at the start of the game, if uh, Pakistan didn't bat first, they couldn't win. And then as soon as Pakistan, uh, as soon as Pakistan was fielding first, I saw all these stats saying, oh, if they bowl England out for 50, then they win it in 2.1 overs or something, you know, something like that. They still can qualify, but Either way, England made a, a reasonable start and, and the game was all over and Pakistan were out of the tournament, essentially, and New Zealand were in. So, yeah, huge celebrations in my house. Stuart, do you think the decision to run shirtless down your street screaming out, <laughs> he called heads, he called heads, is a regrettable one, or do you stand by that choice? Oh, look, I, look it's, it wouldn't be the first time I've run down the street uh, shirtless celebrating a uh, New Zealand-based team's victory. So, yeah, look, um, I don't mind... I don't mind doing that, and uh, yeah, obviously pretty stoked to to be in the semi-finals. So yeah, look, we we don't need to cover my celebration in too much more detail. We can probably move to the game, but yeah, very very pleased that that toss came came down the right way, and there was no stress for New Zealand. Really, is is the main thing. Right. Well, so we are going to move on and talk about the game. I thought we were just <laughs> going to move on on the on on the podcast. So um, yeah, look, I guess from an England perspective. Um, too little, too late in terms of that batting order. Um, to an extent, firing, we, we saw some runs at the top of the order for Johnny Bairstow. Um, yeah, kind of looked a little bit scratchy early on. It was a really, really slow um, slow wicket. Um, ball just sort of gripped in it a little bit. Um, I, I'm Yeah, I, I kind of looking at the square from the overhead shots, it doesn't look like there's a fresh pitch on that block either. So, um, looks like one of the semi-finals is going to be played on a, a used wicket there as well, which look I hope doesn't ruin uh, ruin the spectacle. Um, Joe Root scoring his third fifty of the tournament as well for for England um, after two in the uh, the first two games of the, of the tournament. Um, Stokes continued, I think you know what you would say is reasonable form for him and, and probably vindication for him. Um, playing in this tournament solely as a batter, um, despite any questions it might cause on, on on the balance. But I think the standout for, for me is um, that David Willey's last game in an England shirt it was uh, was yesterday. Um, barring any you know calls for him to come out of retirement when we get some injuries going into that T20 World Cup. Um, but yeah, I mean he, he really knocked the top off that 
um, Pakistan already getting um, Abdullah Shafiq and Fakir Zaman uh, early up, and and then also picked up yeah picked up the wicket of Aga Salman as well. Um, and I think named as yeah player of the match. So I think a nice final uh, final hurrah, a last dance for for David Willey. Um, but yeah, I think Stu, if if you kind of look at it from a body language perspective, Pakistan looked like they they enjoyed you know enjoyed the game. Um, you know, I, I, you didn't see them sort of moping around in the field, but it kind of almost looked like one of those end of season games where um, you're not quite going through the motions because this is international sport, but they were just you know almost playing for the fun of having a having a hit out both teams, and I, I think that you know probably told a little bit in uh, yeah in England's batting performance had a little bit of freedom there um, throughout the course of the course of the match. Yeah, look, and and uh, I think it's an interesting one for Pakistan because, uh, yeah, they, I would argue they haven't been very good in this tournament. I know that they've been, you know, they they were in with a shout up until uh, you know that toss did hit the hit the floor really. But I think we saw kind of a lot of the stuff that hasn't been good for Pakistan throughout this game. You know, you you talked about how the pitch was tricky, a bit quite tricky early on. Um, and we saw Shaheen Shah Afridi especially uh, extract a bit of that in his first kind of two or three overs. But from the other end, Harris Ralph, first three overs, 31, you know, 31 for none off his first three overs while, you know, while the score was only 38 for none after those first six. So I, th- I think him in particular has been someone, I mean, obviously they've missed Nassim Shah, but him and pa- Harris Ralph in particular, he, although he did, you know, to give him some credit, he did come back nicely and, and finish off with a couple of or three wickets there in the end. But, you know, he's been, I think, really, really uh, probably a big disappointment, I would say, for Pakistan. We we sort of expected him to be someone who would bowl at serious pace and take wickets throughout this tournament, probably through those middle stages, which we've seen are so crucial to kind of restricting opposition. And he was just all over the place in that those first few overs, big wides, you know, hasn't been consistent with his lengths and lines. And, yeah, they, you know, England... Bearstow and, and uh, Milan got on top of him, and uh, yeah, from then on, you know, once you get a platform in these in these games, it's it's very easy to kick on, and yeah, they they did that really nicely. You mentioned Stokes before, um, obviously, yeah, obviously he's contributed well in these last couple of games. Do you think there's any sort of thought that uh, I know he? There's been a bit of talk about how he maybe could have gone home and and got that knee operation done a bit earlier. He was very much, you know. No, that you know I've committed to this campaign. We're staying out to this end of this campaign. There's got to be some. There must have been some temptation to to say, okay, like we've got this five test series against India. You know, I'm the test captain. That's a series that we want to compete really well in, and, and you know, sort of prove to the world that. Um, although I don't know that their test side needs much more proving, but you know, to show to the world, look, we can go anywhere and, and beat anyone. Do you think there's some kind of thought that he's you know, should have gone home and missed those last few games? No. <laughs> yeah. No, it's Simple a, as that. It, it's a World Cup, Stu, and he's picked in a 15-man squad. Um, he wouldn't have been able to be replaced in that squad. Um, and mm. I, I don't think any human being that's played any level of sport would do that to, to, to their team and say, you know, my, my, knee, my knee injury is more important than you guys potentially having a situation where a couple of people go down on the morning of the game, whether it's a, you know, a sickness bug or, you know, a couple of finger knocks in, in the warmups or whatever. And, and all of a sudden the physios field in at third man. So um, look, a- absolutely, absolutely not. And, and look, I think this tournament, if you look at it, obviously started the tournament late. I think only came in for the game against Sri Lanka, but um, I think had four scores in six knocks. So, mm. um, you know, arguably England's, but, you know, player of the tournament, I think Milan would probably just pip that, um, pick that title for his performances. So, yeah, I don't think there was ever a, an occasion where that's going to going to happen. I, we don't know what this new operation is, um, but given that they're talking about, they think he's going to be able to go to India. It you know it sounds to me like it's a bit of a, a bit of a clean up um, rather than a, you know a, uh, rather than a major reconstruction of anything. Yeah. Um, and then again, I just I just wonder whether or not you know this is to get him fit to go and, and bat and, and and do his rehab and and that, you know the return of him at the bowling crease might still be um more realistic for the english uh, english summer but yeah we we, we we don't we don't really know 
Um, but no, absolutely the right thing for him to stay with his with his team. And I, I think everything that we've seen and know about Ben Stokes, but that's that's him as an individual. Um, I think he played a cut cut his cast off on his arm to play an under thirteen <laughs> cup game because um, he didn't want to let his t- his teammates down. And yeah, twenty years later, he's still he's still doing the same kind of stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Look, fair, fair point. Baldy, anything you want to add on, on this game? England's now qualified for the Champions Trophy, of course. But, yeah, anything you want to add on this game before we move in and, and just give you some runway for Mitchell Marsh conversation? <laughs> I think the the standout point for me was the Rizwan dismissal. It, it kind of summed up Pakistan's entire World Cup in one delivery, you know. He, he got yeah. to 36 or 51. He's a key guy on their side. I think Baba Razam was already out at that point, if I yep. if I if my maths is correct. Yeah, he was really the last guy who could win this game for Pakistan off his own bat, and he runs down the wicket at Moali, which is fine. There's no there's no issue with with you know advancing down the wicket to Moali to try and hit him over the top, but it was on a turning wicket. Moali was getting lots of turn, and he just it, the shot just looked all out of shape. It, it became very agricultural. And Moali delivered a great ball and, and bowled in middle stump, and that was the end of his World Cup. And I feel like that that just that one incident summed up Pakistan's entire tournament. You know, mm. lots of promise, but failed to deliver, and failed to deliver in in a way that was you know pretty a pretty average dismissal, really, for a guy <laughs> of that quality. To be fair, I mean, if that was Saturday afternoon and one of my guys ran down the wicket and and, and played that shot and got bowled at you know what was it then? A hundred for four, you'd be pretty disappointed with that dismissal. So, mm. um, look, I'm sure that that um, Rizwan and, and Baba Razam and the Pakistan team will reflect on what could have been in this tournament. They they got very close to making the semi-finals despite playing what I think they will reflect on being as not their best brand of cricket. Yeah, absolutely. But he did get cramp immediately after, so maybe uh, he should have taken the Glenn Maxwell approach and just uh, <laughs> stand still and, and, and swat it all around. Um, it's the um, new way the forward. Well, let's move on and talk about um, Australia. Um, Australia, Bangladesh. Um, Bordy, I'm just going to let you go on this. Thoughts on, on yesterday's game? And, and please get that analogy you used earlier on in. If you, if you don't, I'll lose respect for you as a human. <laughs> Well, we're going to have to pause the podcast because I can't remember what it was. Um, it was a Top look, Gear reference, a Top oh, Gear yes, reference. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that in when we talk about the batting. I want to talk about the bowling first, though, because mm. you have a look at that Bangladesh scorecard. Starts for one through one through eight, really. I mean, it is a good batting wicket, but Australia just haven't been able in this tournament to take wickets in the power play. What was the power play here? One for 76 in the 11th over when Hassan was dismissed. Australia failed to get wickets early doors in this tournament yet again. I think I said to the Slack channel, my kingdom for a wicket in the power play, and it, re- and it remains true. Australia haven't been able to extract enough seam movement or swing or anything uh, to build pressure in the power play. And you just have a look at that scorecard. They've allowed batters to come in, get starts, build partnerships, and that is going to destroy uh, Australia in the semi-final. We, we'll, I'll save the rest of that rant uh, and conversation for our semi-final preview show. But it remains a big concern for me this bowling lineup and their ability to create opportunities early in the game where conditions should favour uh, great exponents of swing and seam in Stark, Hazelwood, and Cummins. So more on that later. Just teasing that uh, semi-final preview episode there brilliantly, but. It was a good uh, a good outing again for Adam Zampa. Uh, if only the seam bowlers have been listening to my criticism as heavily as Adam Zampa did <laughs> early in the tournament. Uh, he has turned it around magnificently. Another two for 32 off his 10 overs. Uh, really, really good. Um, but, well, the, area... oh, let me, yeah, let yeah, me jump ahead. in here because I've got to... Um, yeah, I, I again want to... Uh, let's pick up this, the opening bowling conversation uh, a bit later on. Yeah, absolutely delighted that we're going to be in the same room, the four of us, uh, later on to, to chat through these semifinals now that they're all nailed down. But uh, our friend of the show, Bharat Sundarason, uh, had a great stat on Twitter uh, about the opening partnerships against Australia. So they've, the average throughout the tournament has been 63.5. And when they bowl first, it goes up to 86.75. So, yeah, it's been a, a real problem area for, for Australia. And, um, I mean, you, you're right to mention Zampa because... Bangladesh was in line for a, a big score. You know, they got they made 300, which 
you know, traditionally we still see as a, a big score, but I think they could have got many, many more. And I think, you know, they'll look at this innings. They were 180 for three after 30. I think they'll look at 306 for eight when they, you know, look back and reflect and think, geez, we could have got plenty, plenty more and, and yep. really made this tough for Australia. But yeah, Zampa, 100%. Zampa, very, very good. One for six in his first four overs. Yeah. P- uh, Bangladesh should have got 330 minimum. From from 180 for, what, three at 30 overs, double it and take away 10 for every wicket. That's minimum 330, minimum mm. in this yeah. day and age. So so that was that was disappointing for them. I think they'll reflect on that and they'll have a look at the way that their card lined up. Six guys get to 20 and, and only one of them gets past 45. None of them go on to get a really big score. Although um, Tofid Hridoy... Uh, did get a did get a seventy four, and I think that's his highest uh, highest score certainly in this World Cup. So um, mm. he's done well. Look, the best of Australia's bowlers really were Adam Zampa and Manus Lubbershane. To be fair, everyone else was pretty. <laughs> everyone else was pretty average. Manus had two for Zampa had two for uh, Sean Abbott. But his two for sixty one gives him the second best average of any Australian in this World Cup through the group stage, which is mm. you know that's that's pretty disappointing when your second best bowler is averaging thirty point five, and you've got. Cummins and Hazelwood and Stark in that in that seam attack. So we'll get onto that a little bit later. Look, uh, Travis Head was effective. You know, he played the little Maxwell role in there. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about Stoinis and, and Marsh's uh, economy rates when we get to that semi final preview as well. Uh, do we want to talk anything more about the bowling innings, Bixie, before we move on to the batting? I don't think so, Paul. All I'd say is just, you know, it marginal improvement. If your average um, for the first wicket was 80, odd, you got it down to 76 <laughs> in this uh, in this game. But yeah, nothing really to add. I think Bangladesh will be disappointed that no one went on and got, you know, got that big score. Um, you know, whilst, you know, you lament Australia's bowling performance, you did just keep chipping away from a wicket's perspective, you know, 11, 16, 27, 35, 42, um, those are not my lotto numbers from last night, of course, but the, the overs in which the, the wickets fell, it was relatively regular for you. So Bangladesh will be disappointed that, that you know they didn't put together that sort of 20-25 over partnership when they when they had the opp- opportunity to do so. I, but, I think yeah. that sums up their tournament, really, Bangladesh. I mean, yeah, we talked about it before with Pakistan. I think that totally sums up Bangladesh's tournament. There's clearly talent there in, in some of those players, Shanto, Tanzid, Hridoy, like that, they all have sort of flashed signs of yes, there there is some exciting cricketers in there. But then you know you look at their averages: Shanto twenty seven, Tanzid sixteen, Fredoy thirty two. You know one fifty for for each of them. Or Shanto's actually got two. And that Bangladesh has only got one hundred in this whole World Cup. You know it, they just haven't been able to fire. And you know they, I think you know when we get to the next World Cup, Mamadoula. Uh, Shakib, who didn't play this game, Mushvika, you know, are they going to be there? Possibly not. So some of these youngsters have, have got, as we talked about with Sri Lanka in, in the last chat that I was on the show, you know, they've, they're going to have to stick with some of these youngsters and hope that by the time this next World Cup comes around, they're ready to go and ready to contribute sort of much, much more consistently than showing these flashes. So, yeah, again, a lot for Bangladesh to kind of think about when they get back. And, um, yeah, it's... It, it, it looks like they might qualify for the Champions Trophy at least, uh, if as long as the Netherlands don't get an unlikely victory against India. But uh, yeah, still, still a lot of work for them to do uh, going forward. Bordy, let's move on to the to the batting. Um, we'll, we'll just sort of open up to let you talk about um, the innings. I do want to pose one question to you, if you can cover when you when you talk through that batting. Made the early decision in the tournament for Josh English to, to replace Alex Carey. He was carded, mm. I think, to come in and bat um, number six, followed, I think, by Stoyness at seven. His form in this tournament with bat and gloves, you know, we know he's an inferior wicketkeeper to, to Alex Carey, um, but hasn't really fired with a bat. Is that something that worries you going into the semi finals? But I guess before that, do you want to talk about the dominance mm. of your, your batting performance last night? It's really pleasing to see Australia do what Bangladesh failed to do in their innings, and that's build big partnerships. If you have a look at, again, just have a look at the scorecard. One for 12 when Head was dismissed, and then Warner and Marsh put on 120 to get themselves into the game, and that allows Steve Smith 
and Mitchell Marsh to, to build a even bigger partnership, sort of 175 unbeaten, to get Australia home in what is a really, really pleasing chase from a number of perspectives. Firstly, that Mitchell Marsh and Steve Smith have slotted into that number three, number four role. Probably not either of their preferred positions in the lineup. I think Mitchell Marsh would prefer to open, but he's behind Head and Warner, who have been spectacular. Smith would prefer to bat at three, I think, rather than at four. But they have built a great rapport with each other in that uh, three, four position. And that's hugely important for Australia. If they're going to win knockout games of cricket, those guys have to score a butt ton of runs. Because, as you say, Josh Inglis is struggling at the moment, and we haven't seen the best of Marcus Stoinis either as a finisher. So there are still some challenges for Australia, and we'll talk about those when we get to the semi-final preview show. But it was really pleasing to see Australia build big partnerships, bat well together in partnerships. Uh, David Warner has had an outstanding World Cup. I think he's close to 500 runs. If not, he's there already uh, in this World Cup. So he's had a really, really good tournament uh, for Australia. And Mitchell Marsh... His, I think his highest score for Australia. And then we've had back-to-back you know, uh, performances from Australian batters that have allowed us to chase record, um, record chases in World Cups for Australia. And we've had to because we haven't bowled particularly well to either of those two sides, uh, allowed them to get big, you know, big, big scores that we've had to chase down. So from a purely batting perspective, this is a great outcome for Australia. Steve Smith has got runs that are run a ball, looked very comfortable, he was able to just work the ball into gaps and he was able to manipulate the field without hitting too many boundaries. He's only hit sort of four fours and a six, whereas Marsh has hit 17 fours and nine sixes in his 177. So I really like the way that Steve Smith went about his innings. He didn't have to blast the ball. Run a ball 60-70 for Australia is a great outcome, particularly if Mitchell Marsh can go hard early on. We want... Mitchell Marsh to be the Jeremy Clarkson of the Australian cricket team, (laughs) i.e. power. We need to see the power because if he bats like he has batted in this tournament when he's been uh, inhibited, he's been a little bit tentative against spin, particularly after you get out of the power play. He hasn't really shown much intent. And he actually, I think, said that in the post-match interview. He's had a couple of games for Australia where he's been a little bit tentative. He hasn't dominated. He hasn't exerted his authority on the opposition bowlers. And that's not his natural game. He needs to hit the ball, as he did in this innings, powerfully through the offside. If he gets anything in his zone, he needs to be going over the top of the field. And even with guys back, he was mishitting balls last night, 20 rows back into the stands, because he is so, so strong. What I would give to have Mitchell Marsh's frame uh, like, he has got an unbelievable physique, and he can hit the ball so hard. I mean, I'd waste it. My batting talent is zero. <laughs> but it, to have, at least have his frame to be able to clunk sixes uh, would be spectacular. So, look, a great innings from Mitchell Marsh, continuing his, like, rich vein of form, really, and renaissance over the last two years for Australia. Uh, his highest score, I believe, for Australia. And we've chased down record scores back-to-back. So, it is a good thing, I think, for Australia in this, in terms of this hit-out to have to do that. Uh, I just wish that we'd been chasing 250 instead of 306. And yeah, Baldy, Josh, the... Josh Inglis, you, you, avoid, you always avoid the tough question, Baldy. Josh Inglis. I'm deferring the question to the semi-final show because I think it is a real area of concern and has been for a long time. Um, he averages, what, 18, Stu, in this tournament, I think you said, or, or Binksy. Yeah. Um, really not enough from a top six player. Uh, would we got more out of Alex Carey had we stuck with him? Quite possibly, quite possibly. Um, we've seen Alex Carey score hundreds in the past. I think the only other time that Australia have chased down 300 in the last four years was when Carey and Maxwell both got hundreds uh, in a chase. So, you know, he has that in him. He's, he, like you say, Adam, I wouldn't say Josh Inglis is an inferior wicketkeeper. What I would say is, is Alex Carey is world-class with the gloves. Um, and Josh Inglis is a, a wicketkeeper batter, or a better wicketkeeper, if you like. He's very tidy, uh, but he's not in the same class as, as Alex Carey. Uh, that's for sure. We need more out of Josh Inglis if Australia are going to win the tournament because, you know, we're not going to see Marsh and Maxwell get big hundreds in the semi final and the final. And if Stoinis is in the side, and we'll get to this uh, in the semi final preview then it means that we've kind of carrying two guys in the batting lineup, and we can't carry them and the bowlers uh, all, all at the same time. Well, you might get hundreds from Maxwell and, and Marsh in the, in the final. 
in the semi and final. You you never know. They've been uh, they've been very good at times in this tournament. It, and I I wanted to pick up on the word power that you used there for Marsh because Ian Bishop actually said in the commentary, "Easy power." He is the way he described it, and I, I thought that was a wonderful way to describe it because yeah, you you talked about Marsh's frame and just the way that he hits. He hit one off uh, Mustafiza, I think, straight back over his head. It, it's just pleasant, isn't it? And like when he gets, when he hits through the line, it just stays hit. You know, I mean, that's a, a big cricketing cliche, but it's just pleasant to watch. And it, and it feels like it, if he hits it nicely, it's six. It doesn't really matter about anything else because of that power that he has. And yep. yeah, look, he's you know, I I just that T Twenty final uh, a couple of years ago that where he just smashed New Zealand all around the park just still gives me nightmares when I think about Mitchell Marsh because. You know, you just can't stop him when he's in that kind of form, and that was sort of the way he did did things today. And yeah, look, you know, if he's if he's going to do that, and you've got you know Warner and, and Head up the top, it does make for an incredibly powerful Australian batting lineup. That middle order, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna talk about that a bit more later on when we, when we chat in more detail about the two semi-finals. But yeah, boy, that they really do have some power up the top with that Australian top three. Yeah, Marsh's Marsh's levers are the best in world cricket. Honestly, he's he's got that bigger frame. He's what six foot plus. Um, he's a big, strong man. He's got great core. Um, he's got really, really strong, you know, core muscle groups. And 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 he just hits the ball straight. He keeps his shape. You know, unlike the Rizwan dismissal, he keeps his shape through the line of the ball. And as you say, when he hits them, they stay hit. And and if he can maintain that kind of mentality of okay. It doesn't matter if I miss hit it on these grounds in India. It's still going to go well over the boundary. I mean, there was one that I think um, he hit that was attempted to be caught, and the guy was so far over the boundary he couldn't throw it back. You know, <laughs> yeah. so even his miss hits are going to go for six. And I think if Australia are going to win this tournament, he needs to continue with that mentality. And if we can get some contributions with him uh, from him in the knockout games, we're going to be in a good position. Awesome. Well, we're going to cover that as you mentioned, Baldy. Um, throughout the course of our preview show. So we are going to be recording. It's Sunday morning here in New Zealand, um, reviewing these games. But we're catching up Sunday afternoon um, to record that in-person um, semi-final preview. Talking of averages, and um, there is a, a top-order average here as well. When it's us three on the podcast, we tend to exceed the time limit more often than not. <laughs> um, we are the three that, 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 that do probably talk too much. Um, in terms of the other game, the final game of the group stages, that takes place um, tonight. Really nothing on that other than, I, I guess, um, India being in a position to yeah, have a clean sweep through the course of this tournament if they maintain their winning ways against the Netherlands. And the Netherlands, if they do pull off, as I think, Stu, you referred to it as a, an unlikely victory, um, with Pakistan hosting that um, Champions Trophy, it would mean that the Netherlands qualify um, by virtue of finishing in eighth place, um, but Pakistan, of course, would would be in that all important seventh place. Um, so they they get bumped up by one. But unless there's anything else we we want to cover, we will be back on the uh, top order podcast semi finals preview show in your feed. We will be back in the morning as well um, with a wrap up of that India Netherlands game, and then of course we'll appear. Um, our normal slot to uh, get some content out to you by about eight o'clock in the morning, New Zealand time, um, 8 p.m. Um, in the UK. And I can't do the time conversions for other time zones <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, we will be back with the semi final wrap ups as well, um, pretty much in real time. And then, of course, um, we'll have a This Week in Cricket where we'll cover some of the bigger talking points from the tournament, um, whether it's, you know, changes to the timed out rule. Um, whether it's, you know, whether salt tablets should be allowed. All of these questions we'll, we'll ask, answer in our This Week in Cricket review of the tournament as well. Um, but for now, it is good morning, good bless from us all here in Auckland. We'll see you very, very soon in your podcast feed uh, with more cricketing content. See you later.